a new CIFA and what being equal really God, means. What a rubbish title. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should start off by, by um, giving a further complication that um, uh, particularly in this period of period, and particularly given some of the things I, I feel uh, uh, emboldened to say, uh, everything I say is completely a personal perspective and in no way reflects anything whatsoever to do with any organisation <laughs> I might wish to be employed by <laughs> after now. <laughs> uh, but, but because I'm aware, this is, uh, this is a very personal thing and it's interesting, so many of the things being said now you know, have today really, really deeply resonated with me. Um, Sarah's point about a work, this is entirely personal because I wrote this and come up with all this entirely in my, my own big time. This is nothing to do with my day job. It should be, but it just isn't. And, and the points about parenting in particular, I mean, it's fascinating the contrast. I'm, I'm a, uh, a fairly new urban parent, but the challenges are, are exactly the same. It's just a different context. My wife and I are celebrating right now that we've just got our daughter into a, uh, a new nursery, which is only £50 a day. Uh, which is a, a huge, huge improvement. It's just, it's, it's ridiculously expensive. I want to talk about um, gender equality in the broadest sense, and I'll, there's only a very few of these I'm primarily going to talk. Um, I've got one random picture just because I've got to put up pictures of my cute daughter because those of you who know me on Facebook know that it's all I do. I used to, <laughs> I used to rant angrily about heritage things on Facebook, and now I just put pictures of my daughter. Um, one of those terrifying blonde children is my daughter, and, and, and given this session, it amused me that they're both blonde, but one is wearing bright blue and one's wearing bright pink. Um, these two young women are extremely strong personalities, <laughs> and I know that both of them were just by them. Um, and, and the reason they're wearing those clothes is entirely because actually we inherit all of them. And one is mine, one is our best friend's daughter. Um, none of those clothes are bought, all of those are inherited from other random people. But it may make strong points about gender. This was the kind of introduction bit. I'm going to move on immediately to the next slide, I think, actually, because I'm, I've, I've, kind of, I've been changing my thinking, <laughs> literally, as I listen to other speakers. I come with a quote from Wikipedia. You should never quote from Wikipedia, so I'm going to do what we all do and, and acknowledge it. That comes from Wikipedia. Because I thought it was a useful and interesting view of what the definition of gender equality is, which I immediately thought, well, I like some of that, but it worries me hugely uh, in other aspects of it, particularly the, the absolute binary uh, opposition of men and women. So I came up with my own one, which doubtless you'll hate, but I hope it better sums up a sense of uh, gender equality. Uh, gender equal equality of opportunity for all, in all circumstances, at all times, on all terms, without discrimination by any, struck me when I wrote this about 10 at night, about three <laughs> days ago, possibly having had a drink or two, as a, as a reasonable estimation of where we might wish to get. Uh, and my concern very much is that, uh, absolutely, continuing on the theme of this session, that that isn't being achieved in any circumstances right now. It isn't being achieved generally in society. Um, Sarah's, Sarah's terrifying um, uh, read, uh, tweets and, and quotes demonstrate that, and it certainly isn't being demonstrated in the sector. The one which really gets me on this one consistently was that extraordinary circumstance about a year ago now where um, Sela Creasy and a series of other women uh, got death threats and rape threats for suggesting that a woman should be on, I think it was the five pound note, and I remember just literally standing dumbfounded in my kitchen that anyone could ever get so angry about such an arcane thing as banknotes. I mean, and, and the self-evident benefits of having a range of people on banknotes, which is I'm <laughs> speechless to this day. Anyway, a lot of my thinking about this broader area, though, has come back to, to, to the previous one about being new parent. My daughter just passed two. She's a little girl, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified. Now, I suspect I would be terrified under any circumstances, and I suspect I would be terrified if it was a little boy. But I am particularly terrified because of the kind of things that Sarah, uh, well, all of the, the, the people presenting today so far, have highlighted. Uh, she is currently a little girl, uh, well she was, I don't know, what's the crossover from baby to girl, anyway, she's <laughs> currently a little girl, she will eventually become a woman and the threats and challenges and the sense of backward movement that, that I certainly see and I agree with other people seeing uh, worries me a lot. And so my wife and I, in the way of well-meaning middle-class uh, professionals, have been constantly assessing this and going online and, and following a thousand and one different things. Uh, and 
particularly thinking about how we can bring her up to be self-confident, to be positive, to hopefully challenge, um, ideally without death threats ever being made to her, some of these issues. I've been much inspired in this, I might add, by discussions both positive and negative with her godless parents. Um, th these are close friends of ours. Um, I I'm profoundly irreligious, as many of you are aware. Uh, and so she has some godless parents who do a very, very good job bringing her up to, to, to be a, uh, a broad and happy human being. But one of those godless parents works in LGBT charity in London. And that individual, I'm not going to name their gender because I think it's completely irrelevant, uh, has done a wonderful job educating me uh, about issues of equality and responsibility, particularly corporate responsibility from organisations, uh, that, to be honest, a heterosexual old white guy like me um, doesn't deal with. And, and we come back to the fact that here I am, um, I'm not a token, because the problem is I'm the token man in this extraordinary rare circumstance. Normally I'm the dominant personality, and, and, and it shows the absolute unfairness of this. But I've been thinking a lot because of this about this whole sense of I'm going to come back to actually where I've written things down, finally. And so I'm concerned at heart, uh, rather than ranting, I'm concerned at heart that archaeology in general and Sifa as a microcosm of this remains an unequal place in all regards, by gender, by age, by ethnicity, by sexuality and by class. What can be summed up as the old white man syndrome. I'm aware of the irony here of another ageing white man being the one to talk about this, which smacks of hypocrisy. Um, here I am, um, um, shout at me and, and tweet. Um, <laughs> angrily at me. Uh, I remain convinced that as individuals, both as members, uh, uh, but also as members of a professional body with a newly chartered status, <coughs> we have a moral obligation, I'm going to re-emphasize a moral obligation to actively improve and to promote equality and diversity. It is far too important an issue not to formally address, and we as a community have a tendency, I fear, to pay lip service to this issue when we ought to do more. I then move on and I decided to do a little bit of research, I did spend some time on this, I promise, and look at what some organisations have been doing in this regard. So I went, first of all, to the CIFA, and thank goodness we have a policy statement. I'm ashamed to admit I didn't realise that. I'm really glad we do have one, but I neatly thought, do I know if we've ever said anything as an organisation? And, and we do. Um, go and look at the, there's, there's the web link, and, and, and whether or not you can find it on your phones is another question. Um, it's quite lengthy, but a couple of points I'll raise, and section 1.2 talks about the policy aims to heighten awareness of equality issues amongst the membership of the Institute and to encourage employers to adopt guidelines. Okay, so um, um, later on, it says in 1.6, the very last paragraph, talks about through its professional development and practice committee, the Institute is committed to a programme of positive action to make this policy fully effective. Now these are good and strong words, um, very welcome, but as I've written here, I'll have to be honest, uh, they seem longer words short on specific actions, and please someone, please someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't feel that these are being actively pursued. I may be completely wrong, I am very stupid and I'm very easily distracted. There may be an array of things going on, I hope there is. I've not noticed it myself. Um, the change we want to be, I think, probably is coming out today. I think the next um, paper by Hannah will probably say, basically, a lot of very sensible things about where we may go next. So. CIFA has it. I then went looking at a few others, and, and I, I, I just started plucking from my own experience where we might look. I looked for the European Association of, Archaeo uh, the European Association of Archaeologists. Um, I couldn't find anything. It is possible there is something there. there is Again, not. I'm rubbish at the web. There we are. So Jerry says that Jerry Waits says there isn't anything. I was a bit disappointed by that because um, Rachel, I think, gave some really, really good stats for much better uh, standards and condition of working in general uh, with the, uh, in Europe or well, subsections of Europe and Scandinavia. There isn't anything. I looked at the Register of Professional Archaeologists, which is the, kind of the closest equivalent to the CIFA in the United States. And interestingly, they don't have a formal policy statement, but they do have a note about their code of conduct and sexual harassment. I felt that um, that says volumes about some of the issues which we are raising here. I'll quote selectively from this additional note about sexual harassment. Um, it talks about the primary federal law in the US dealing with this issue is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Look at that date, 64, that huge resonance of that Civil Rights Act. Sex discrimination involves treating an applicant or employee unfavorably because of that person's sexual sexual persuasion, but can also involve treating someone less favorably because of his or her connection with an organizational group. Uh, they go on, and the really interesting bit um, is at the end, 
Uh, to reinforce its position on sexual harassment, the Register has recently modified its guidelines and standards for archaeological field school certifications. Um, it is interesting, it is clear reading behind the scenes here that they're, they're, they are recognising formally the implicit problems of sexual harassment, particularly in archaeological field work, and that is, let us face it, entirely, I suspect, uh, men sexually harassing women. I, I would suspect that it is a, a non-existent or tiny, tiny percentage of times in which it is ever women sexually harassing men. <laughs> well, the, so vaguely less awful than we thought. Well, it's still there. Well, it's Just still as awful. awful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, on the giant pile of awfulness, it's sort of a, a tiny, tiny, tiny speck in one corner. Um, I then also finally looked at the Australian Association of Consulting Archaeologists and couldn't find anything, which again is sort of broadly equivalent to the CEPA and the uh, RPA in the United States. And I was surprised because. My experience, I mean, I was really excited to hear um, the, 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 the news about things like um, uh, maternity wear, which can be brought on Australia, but, but, but can't be got over here. And I do, I'm aware through, through personal and professional contacts with Australia, that in some ways uh, they, they are, are, are probably more advanced than in England. Um, and I was, I was kind of slightly saddened about that. To move on then, we clearly got a problem that organisationally we basically we pay lip service to this, this, this general issue of equality, but we are not doing nearly enough. In terms of sector equality, well, we've had a whole series of very, very useful stats coming from a number of different directions. I go back to Paul Everall's book, The Invisible Diggers, which remains an extraordinarily useful resource. I don't just say that because Paul's an old, old friend. It is the only really in-depth analysis. There are lots of more regular sector surveys, which I think are very useful. But in terms of kind of a, a sustained body of evidence, looking at a community over a period of time. It's fascinating. And, and Paul has this particular quote, I don't need to read it to you, but it, it, it simply reinforces, uh, w well, what anecdotally we hear and what we see sort of hidden amongst the statistics. I'm now going to move on to the most difficult bit of this paper. Um, it's a bit, I'm very nervous about but I feel I have to say something about it. And it comes back to uh, what Sarah said in her paper about just the insidious nature of uh, a very, very male-dominated situation. I'm going to quote from, uh, 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 um, I don't know what you call it, Facebook Messenger uh, message I sent to Sarah. And this was at the end of the CIFA launch at the Museum of London uh, last December. And I'm very, very sad to say to quote talking about Chief, CIFA Chief Executive Pete Hinton now. Pete is a very good man. I have great respect for him. Fortunately, he said remarks at the CIFA conference, which I found extremely sad. So I'll, I'll read you the whole thing. I said at the end of the CIFA launch, Pete made a prolonged joke about the early days of the IFA, which was a bunch of sexist, misogynistic bullshit. <laughs> he joked about how it was lots of tan men who came down from the mountains and spread their seed and went on to make crude, make crude allusions to the free love of the 70s period through, through saying, who knows who our parents are, oh, and I put in brackets, which I also found hugely offensive more broadly, because like most of you, I'm pretty confident about the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fairly so He we went on and on, and if it had been Pete down the pub, it might have been one thing. Well, I think mm. we're saying that wouldn't still have no. been appropriate even then, but it might be one thing, that's what I said at the time. But at the formal launch of Chartered Institute, I found it deeply unprofessional and inexcusable. Casually sexist, misogynistic, and generally unprofessional. I left despairing of archaeology, the CIFA, the perception of people in our community, and ashamed to be a man, husband, and father. Basically, it was a mess. Now, I don't think Pete was going out to deliberately cause problems. I don't think Pete is a misogynist person. I think he is caught, like so many of us, in circumstances. But we should be challenging this. My God, we are a chartered organisation. That is a very, very rare beast. We have now special privileges, but we have special expectations. We cannot allow things like a casualness like that to, to, to be part of our culture. That isn't political correctness, it's just the right thing to do, and it comes back to that moral obligation. I've written here, we should, could, and must do better as individuals and as a community, and ought to challenge casual inequality. To conclude, I have no idea how my time is doing, I suspect <laughs> I'm profoundly stealing uh, uh, um, the next presentation, so I'm going to try not to steal it, but I'm going to make a few suggestions. No, but the next presentation after the conference. Oh, you're right. <laughs> okay. Well, all right, carry on. Yeah, but I'm feeling... <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I, fe I, I fear I'm stealing your thunder, so I'm going to try to not say that. I'm in a fight. Okay, I'll oh, shut up. <laughs> Just going to focus for a second. Look out the window of a very fine piece of brutalist architecture over there. Which I might list later. Oh, no, I can't find it. So, I'm going to go back to my notes. Archaeology is not the worst profession in this respect, but it isn't the best either. There are lessons we can learn from other sectors and organisations, and we ought to pursue, aggressively in my opinion, a more proactive approach to gender equality. Some of this comes back um, to the starting point that this is, in my view, a fundamental moral obligation on us as individuals and members of an organisation. There's also the fact that by the nature of our professional diversity, spanning so many different sectors, organisations and communities, uh, we, can, we are perhaps uniquely well placed to influence others. I go on, I wrote here, archaeologists can encourage gender equality on building sites in the middle of cities or on remote farmlands, within government offices or at schools and universities, to name four examples. We ought to embrace this opportunity because there are a lot of people who don't have the opportunity to talk. And I'm not saying necessarily uh, proselytising in some very, very religious manner, but through the consistent and rigorous demonstration of good practice, one would hope that there would be that influence. And that is how we do combat this casual everyday, this, by saying that isn't appropriate, and things like this aren't appropriate. I'd also remind people that working on gender equality can be part of our organisation's broader pursuit of working conditions. Well, this is, this is consistent with coming back. It's not a moral crusade or some political correctness to say that people should be equal. It helps all of us. My God, I'm struggling just as much uh, as many of the women I know with all of the same issues of particularly parenting. My wife and I are determined to try to be as equal as possible. But however hard we work, we find the cards stacked against culturally institution. Mm -hmm. Sarah's absolutely raised this. I am in a position where almost without well, question Everyone just assumes that I am the uh, major payer. Now, well, very unusually, I'm not. I'm delighted to say that my wife earns uh, significantly more than me. Uh, and <laughs> long may that continue. <laughs> uh, but certainly in terms of childcare, the default position without fail is always that they will phone my wife first, that they will email her, that uh, if they, in fact, we, we both have to hold doctorates, but they will always assume that the first name doctor is the man, not the woman. Um, a whole load, you know, it's, it's these insidious issues, which are just depressing. They really are. I, mean, I have to say, I'm enjoying the session enormously, but the levels of depression, <laughs> besides large quantities of alcohol and <laughs> close future. So, what do we do about this? To conclude, I said I very much support Hannah's proposal for a, a seat for equality and diversity seat special interest group. I suggest that possibly a good starting point could do some of the following. I put, first of all, support the development and promotion of more formal equality objectives. That is basically following up on that formal programme of action. It's there in that policy statement. So, my goodness me, let's embrace that if it's there already. Um, <coughs> Next steps there, for example, might be some simple good examples of best practice. I think we've got them. It sounds like Rachel and other people are collecting this data, but formalising those very good examples. Also, let's face it, formalising where we have to, the bad examples, my God, maybe naming and shaming some mm -hmm. people. I'm in a bad position where I've left some jobs, so maybe I could go back and sh throw some shit at some of the people who know them. <laughs> employ me. Obviously, I'll never be able to go down that route ever again, and it might be there. But another area which really struck me is going back to my godless parents analogy is training in equality and diversity issues for non-sector partners. My godless, my godless parent, who works for the LGBT community in London, is someone who spends a lot of time raising general issues of diversity and equality. Um, and it's interesting, she spends a lot of time in universities, and it really depresses me. The stats she's telling me about, the, again, the levels of casual sexism endemic amongst the student body right now. I, I don't know if it's her particular example, but um, really, really bad examples. And the levels of homophobia in the universities, some of the universities she's sitting with are, are eye-watering. It's, it's like Sarah saying, I just kind of, my generation just thought we got over the homophobia yes. issue and we just kind of moved on, but we're not. We're really aggressively reversing, very, very disturbingly. So there are some really good sector, uh, other communities out there from whom we can spend a lot of time uh, thinking and learning. Raising genuinely the awareness of gender equality more widely, that is back to that sort of that sense of it's our job to challenge things. And finally, perhaps 
possibly acting as body of expertise on gender issues. Maybe, or I'm assuming we feel we have sufficient expertise. I'm, I'm concerned that maybe we don't. Um, we certainly have, though, to go back to one final point, which, which has kind of been touched upon here repeatedly and, and in other papers, we have this long history of social uh, and gender imbalance in, 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 in particular. There is a, a, a ever-growing body of, of sort of discourse upon this inequality, formalising or more formalising that issue, and, and very much actively recognising it and, and effectively challenging it comes back to um, a phrase which uh, is, is quite often used amongst the heritage community, particularly in the US, of having sites of national shame. Well, effectively, we need to have something that's equivalent. They are formalised sites, but it is recognising formally that we did very bad behaviour in the past and we shall actively seek to uh, not undo that, but, but recognise that and challenge it going forward. You have to kind of formally embrace your past. At that point, I'm going to shut up. <laughs>